Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be with all of you today as um, we're kicking off a new ministry year and summer is done, right? I hope you enjoyed your last couple of days this week. Now we're into fall. I see the leaves are changing color, but we're also, most of us rested, or hopefully most of us rested well during summer. Now it's back to work. And who have you have ever had that thought pass, your, pass through your head where you go like, why on earth should I even work? Have you ever thought of that? Like three of you, the rest are like, no, no, I love it. Like, I'll just do this 24 hours a day. But I think so, at some point we all go through that where we say, why, am, why should I even work? Because some people enjoy their work, but a lot of people hate their work. Some people feel they just get hammered at work. Some people feel like they're working and they don't get any recognition. The question is, should we even work? And a bigger question if you're a Christian is, what on earth does my work have to do with my faith? A very good friend of mine um, back in Cape Town, he, he's an entrepreneur and he starts businesses and works all over the place. And he one day, we were having a barbecue and he said, Louis, if I think of God even once during a work day, that's a lot. And I'm like, that is a problem when the majority of our waking hours is spent at work. And somehow God just goes missing in all of that. And that is why we're starting this new series called Why Work Matters. I believe it's super important for us to figure out the relationship between our faith and our work life. Because if we spend the majority of our waking hours at work, if you're an adult, then we should care about it. And for the next couple of weeks, we will be discovering from a Christian perspective why work actually matters. And if you're not a Christian and like, Louis, uh, this is for you guys, does it matter for me? I want to say yes, because maybe you will learn something about the purpose of work that goes deeper than you just got showing up to work every day just to earn an income. It's more than that. If you are not currently working, maybe you're a, a stay-at-home mom. I want to tell you, you're still doing work. Or occupation where you earn money is not the only kind of work we do as human beings, okay? Maybe you are a teenager or a student that's still in school, and you're like, well, does this matter to me? I want to tell you, by the end of this series, if you pay careful attention, I think it will change the way you're going to pick your job completely. And if you're here today and you're a senior and you're already retired, I want to say you're still working anyway, and my parents as well, right? You never retire completely. But even if somehow you find that you work really little and you can actually rest in your retirement, I think you will hear something of the value that you've brought to the world during your years of rest. So I think there's something in this for, for everyone. And we're going to try to answer three big questions in this series over the next three weeks. One, why should I work? Is there a plan to all of this? Why on earth do I have to do this every day? Two, why is it sometimes so hard to work? Because let's face it, none of us go like, oh, every day is just a breeze. None of us. It's hard sometimes. Like, I'm a pastor, guys, and it's sometimes extremely hard for me. Okay? It's it's like, why is it so hard? What ruins work for us? And then the third week, we're going to be talking about how we can find satisfaction in our work and live out our faith through our work. Now, the series we're going to be doing is based on the three big sections found in this book, a book by Timothy Keller called Every Good Endeavor. And I want to encourage you, I'm going to cover most of what is in this book in short in the next three weeks. But if you are really interested in this, I want to say go and get this book. I had the privilege, Tim Keller sadly passed away a couple of um, weeks ago, but Yolanda and I had the privilege of um, doing a, a four-week international intensive in New York um, under Tim Keller in 2015. We've worked with the Work and Faith um, Institute that they started at Redeemer in New York City. We worked with them back in South Africa as well. So he's had a really big impact on my life, especially when it comes to something like Work and Faith, something that often kind of just disappears in the Christian world. But that has been some of the foundations that Protestantism was built on. We're going to be talking about that a little later. So if you're interested in more, get this book. But I will, I will kind of cover most of it in short during the series. So today, the first part of our series, the topic today is the design for work. The design for work. Why should I work? Is there something more behind this? And this is what I believe. If you want to figure out how something fits together, how it works, 
read the manual, read the blueprints. Okay, I just got new um, cabinets from my office, and they're from Ikea. So if you've ever built Ikea thing, and you're one of those people who say like, oh, I don't need a manual, I can assure you there's at least 10 pieces that's left when you're, you've done putting it together, right? So I'm the opposite. I'm like, I'm rather going to read it and do it correctly. So there's no pieces left except for a couple of spare dowels. No, all of the dowels went in. Like, that's just a couple of spare ones. But if you read the manual, it just works. It fits together. And the same for a car. If you're struggling to drive a new modern car, like, just read the manual. It will tell you to press a button and you're off, right? Like, you go. Like, just read the manual. Figure out what the design is because someone designs Every single thing we have on earth for a purpose. So if you want to know how it works, ask the designer. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go back to the blueprints of work. We're going to go right back to the start of us, start of human beings. And we're going to go to Genesis 1. Now, Genesis, for those of you who didn't grow up in church, is the first book of the Bible that also tells us about how God created the world. And when you are introduced to God in the Bible, it starts with the God who's at work. So let's read from Genesis 1, verse 1, in the New International Version. It says, in the beginning, because remember, God didn't have a beginning. God surpasses time and space and everything we have. But in the beginning of our world, of our universe, when God created it, in the beginning, God created the heavens, and the earth. God created the universe. So we meet a God that is at work. And you might be like, no, Lee, that was creating. Creativity is not a job. Well, it is actually a job. For some of you, it's your occupation, right? Whether you're a potter or an artist with a paintbrush or an artist with a guitar, and you're like, oh, but that's all the artsy people. Oh, no, what about an architect? Like, that's still art. What about an accountant when they have to figure out how to creatively work with the books? And I don't mean in a bad way, but just like in a healthy way, right? <laughs> Please don't do it in the wrong way. I don't mean that creative. What about an arborist who has to figure out what branches to trim of a tree? There's creativity in it. What about a lawyer who has to figure out how to defend a case? There's not a book that says each and every case you do, this is the five steps. They have to be creative. Owen McManus says each one of us were created in the image of a creative God, and there's something creative about most of the things we do every single day. So we find a God that is creating, that is at work. And you might believe that's still not the word work. So let's go to Genesis 2, verse 1 to 2, where it ends how God has created everything. Okay? Genesis 2, verse 1 to 2 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his? He knew someone was going to say, like, you can't preach about work if the Bible doesn't say God didn't work. So I'm like, they just happened to put it in there because God knew someone is going to make that comment. So it's telling you he worked, right? God is working for six days, and he rests on the seventh day. And by the way, I believe that if you cannot fully understand rest the way God intended the seventh day, the other six days are not going to go so well. And if you're like, oh man, that's a problem because I struggle with rest. Don't worry, we've got you covered. January, I'm, I'm keep, I, I'll make a plan to keep you coming back. January, we're talking about rest, God's way, okay? So just keep coming back. So we'll, we'll cover it. But for now, we're talking about work. And we encounter this God that is working and providing. So when God starts creation, he's already working. You see, here is the problem with a lot of us. If you grow up in church, you probably learned about the fall. So when Adam and Eve decided to sin against God, to go against the grain of his design. And I think most of us, even if it's just deep inside, would be like, oh, sin is a concept, or work is a consequence of sin. Work is a consequence of the fall. So we often view work as a curse. And if that is your view, that is probably why you're struggling to work. That's probably why you hate it. If you view it as a curse, as you view it, if you view it as something bad, that's what you're going to expect. 
But work was not an evil that came into the world because people rebelled against God, because they were punished, because they sinned and went against the grain of God's design. Work existed before the fall when God himself worked. So work wasn't, wasn't made for us just to be able to do something. God didn't create work so that we would be the slave of something. In fact, work was not even beneath God. He worked. The Bible doesn't exactly say this, but probably just for the sheer joy of it. He's the God of the universe. He can do what he wants, and he chose to work, to create. We find a couple of images of God that is at work. We, we in the Bible, get this idea of an artist creating a masterpiece. Just go outside and look at the trees that's already changing color and how perfectly everything works together. Listen, we introduce one wrong bug to a country and half of the trees are dead, right? God created everything to fit together so perfectly. Go and look at an eye, like all the colors and the beauty of it, the complexity of the human body that even our modern science can still not completely figure out. And you see this God that is creative, that's creating a masterpiece. We read about a God who's a gardener in Genesis 2 verse 8. He planted the garden. It didn't just go garden and it popped up. It literally says in Genesis 2 verse 8, he planted the garden. So for all of you gardeners, all of you landscapers, like that's a godly job. He planted a garden. We read about a God who takes delight in doing things well because he created and he looks at it and he says, it was good. And we find a God that not only created who worked once, but a God that continues to work as the provider of our world and of human beings throughout the Bible and throughout time. He's still working. He's still providing. We just sang a song about God that is still providing. The God of the Bible is introduced to us as someone who delights in work and creativity. Work predates human beings. Work predates the earth. Work predates the universe. It comes directly from God. And I might be like, okay, Louis, that's cool. God worked. I'm not God. So what does this have to do with me, right? Well, work, I believe, was part of God's design, not just for us as human beings, but he created the world, I believe, to need work. And we're going to read the following part where God actually created us. And you're going to see how this nature, this character of God to work and to be creative, how it at the end of the day affects us. So turn to Genesis Um, 1 verse 26 to 28. This is going to be the majority of what we're going to be reading today. Right at the start of your Bible, just go past the index and you're there. Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28, and we'll be reading from the New International Version. So after God created the world, finally God said, let us make mankind in our image. In our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. What does it say? We were created in the what of God? In the image. That means that God who is creative, God that is at work, we were created in his image. And just to make sure, three times that word is repeated. We were made in the, God says, let us make man in our image. In our image we will make him. Three times it repeats it. And then even the word likeliness, which is similar. So four times it says that we are made in the image of a God that is creative. We are made in the image of a God that is a working God. We are made in His 
image. And not only does he make us in his image, but just in case we misunderstand, God then continues. And by the way, when he says he makes us in his image, he says so that we can rule over the earth. But then just in case anyone missed that as image bearers of the living God, we're made to work. God commissions human beings in verse 28 by saying, be fruitful, subdue the earth and rule. So he's literally telling us, take care of it. Become more. Work the soil. Genesis 2 verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Work was not an afterthought of God. Work was not a curse due to the fall. We were designed in the image of a working and a creative God to work and to be creative. He made us that way. It's part, guys, this is the crazy thing. Work was part of the blessedness of Eden, of paradise. When God created a perfect world before us as human beings came and messed things up because we didn't want to follow his plan, he created work as part of that blessedness. Tim Keller in the book says that work if, if, if God made that into us, if he created us to need work, then work is as much a basic human need as food, as rest, as friendship, as prayer, and as spirituality. Now, what is the problem when a basic human need is not met? Food, of course, you will die, right? But for most of them, when a basic human need is not met in our lives, we experience a sense of inner loss of emptiness. So this means that when we are incapable of working, when we cannot find meaningful work, you will experience a sense of significant inner loss and emptiness. Years ago, this is not just new, okay? Years ago, the writer, in 1949, the writer Dorothy Sayers, in a book, Creed to Chaos, wrote, and she said, what is the Christian understanding of work? It is that work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. It's not just something that we do to live. We live to do it. See, God made us in his image to work, but God's creation that we live in was also planned, not just human beings, but also the rest of the world that we're living in. He planned it. And it is interesting that God made the world. For six days we read that God formed and filled the universe, but the interesting thing is he didn't form and fill it completely. He made it to need work. He designed it that way. He made it so that, we would that it would take work to bring forth all of the beautiful riches that God has built into our world. It will take work of us. There's this untapped potential that's waiting in the world for us and that can only come, to come forth if we work. Think about the diamond ring that your wife might be wearing. That is untapped potential that was sitting under the earth, right? And someone had to do the work to bring it forth. There is just this beauty, but God made the world with all of this untapped beauty and he's saying like, you need to work to bring it forth. And God invites us. Through, even when we're reading Genesis, he invites us along and he's saying like, come, work with me. Continue this development that I started. Be my representatives and represent me well. And it started so early, and this is really interesting to me. And you might read over this. I read the kids, the children's Bible to my girls every day, and you kind of read this every once in a blue moon, you get a, a Back to the story of Genesis. But in Genesis 2, is it verse 19 to 20, um, God tells Adam to name the animals. You might be like, what does naming anything have to do with work, with continuing this development of God? It's naming. Did you know that God didn't tell Adam to name everything? God didn't choose not to name things because it was like, oh, maybe people will not know what it is. You know, I call this structure 
a building and people will be like, oh, we don't know what it is. That's not why he gave Adam the job. God already named certain stuff and we know what it was named. We read that God created light and darkness and then the Bible says, and then he called it day and night. God named certain things. But you see, he left our creation so that we can continue the development process. And therefore, he invites Adam along and he's like, go on with this creativity. Go and name the animals. Be part of what I was doing. You see, if you truly want to be his image bearer, do you want to be an image bearer of Jesus? If you're a Christian, that should be one of your highest priorities. Then carry on God's pattern for des and design for work. To fall, to create, to order, to rule. And just as God provides for his creation, to continue providing for his creation. See, if you can understand that God is a working God, that God is a creative God, and you can understand that we were made in his image to work and to be creative, and that he designed the world to need that work and that creativity, then we need to change the way we think about work. Because I, I don't know what your definition is, but I think often we think of work as a means to an end. And if we want to have a healthy relationship with work, if we want to do it the way God designed it to be, then we cannot see our occupations and the work we do even at home as just a means to an end anymore. See, work wasn't just made to bring order to chaos or to give us an income. It was made for something more. And if we look at work, and, and we said, by the way, just earlier, right, that we cannot have a meaningful life without work. But if we believe that without work we cannot have meaningful lives, then that's, by the way, a problem as well. Because then you're making work your idol. It should not be our idol. Work is part of a meaningful life, but work doesn't equal a meaningful life. It doesn't give us meaning. But work, work has to be more than just finding something out, something through it that I need deep inside of me. And I believe work has to be for every single one of the followers of Jesus across the world, work needs to be a calling. You might go like, whoa, the callings are for pastors. Here's the definition of a calling. A calling means that someone calls you to something and you do it not for your own sake, you do it for their sake. That's why I'm here today. God called me to be a preacher. And I said no for a long time because I thought I could do something better than that. But then I said yes, not for my sake. I said yes because he called me to it for his sake and for the sake of the church. That's a definition of a calling. And that can go for every single job on planet Earth. The problem is we don't view it that way. We view work mainly as a means of self-fulfillment, as a means of self-realization, a source of power, a source of money, right? A means to make a living, to put bread on the table. And here's the problem. If that is our primary definition of work, why we need it, here's the reality. It slowly crushes your soul. That's why we sometimes hate it. It crushes my soul because why do I need to keep doing the same thing over and over just so I can have bread on my table? There must be a better way, right? And some color says it actually even undermines society itself. And you know what I'm talking about when I say that? When we find our self-esteem and self-worth in our careers, we start looking for high paying positions. We start looking for high status jobs, right? We worship the high paying, high status jobs, and we look down at the ones we believe is low paying and low status. But when we have this wrong view, when we do things mostly for money and power and self-actualization, it leads to that breakdown of society. It leads to abuse in the workplace. It leads to stress in the workplace. It leads to burnout. It leads to a disappointment every time I fail at something or when I don't get the promotion because I'm in this for money, power, identity, whatever it might be. And we often complain about this in other people. I've heard this so many times in South Africa, and maybe it's a little different here, but... We have private healthcare in South Africa as well. 
And I've heard so many times where people would say, oh, today's doctors are only in it for the money. They don't actually care about the patients. I'm certain some of you have said it here as well. My wife studied law. Do you know how many times I heard jokes about laws, uh, lawyers, that lawyers are sharks? That they're just in it for the money? So let me ask you, what about you? Like, I'm just a garbage collector, a gardener. If you're doing it for the money, you're exactly as those people that you blamed that's in it for the money. There's no difference. Then we're all the same. But here's the beauty. The gospel of Jesus frees us from this relentless pressure of having to prove ourselves, of trying to secure our identity through work, of trying to make sure that we have financial security. It frees us from that. Because in Jesus, we've already been proven. In Jesus, we already have an identity. In Jesus, we already have security. We've been set free. In Jesus, we have what we need that even surpasses this life. So it sets me free. And that also means that it sets me free from a condescending attitude I might have towards less sophisticated forms of, of work, of labor, right? And envy about the, the, the high position, the exalted kind of jobs. Let me tell you why God created work. Not just to continue this process, not just to reflect Him. But when you look at the very character of God that continues to provide for His creation, you will quickly realize that work was never made to just benefit myself. It was made to reflect the character of God. Two things. His creativity and work and His provision. We sang today that the God who provided then is the God who provides today. Work was created to reflect that character of God. And that means that every single job is important because every single type of work we can do is a way to love God and reflect Him well and a way to love our neighbor. You might be like, that's impossible. How, how can my job love my neighbor? Let, let's talk about something simple. Bread. Jesus said, pray for your daily bread. It doesn't just fall out of the air, right? Someone makes it. They're like, oh yeah, I like bread. I can see how the baker loves me. That makes sense. But you know, like all the truck drivers, they can't love me. How does the bread, how does the corn and the maize and whatever we need, the wheat, get transported to factories? But someone who drives a truck, it is an act of love to his neighbors. If he doesn't do that, you won't have bread. What about the guy who did the construction? It's like, no, he just fills bottles. No, without him doing work on the roads, the truck wouldn't be able to get to the factory. The baker wouldn't be able to bake the bread. You would still be hungry. What about the farmer who prepared that or the worker that harvested? Like each and every job some suddenly becomes important because it is a way to love God and represent Him well and a way to love our neighbor. And what is interesting, I said that part of the Reformation was built on this foundation. Both John Calvin and Martin Luther was kind of like the fathers, if we can say it that way, of the Reformation, the Reformers. Both of them agreed and argued that all work, even what they called the so-called secular jobs, was as much a calling from God as the ministry of monk or priest. So let's go back to what I said. If you want to view work differently, you cannot see it as a means to an end. You have to view it as a calling. What's the definition of a calling? Someone else calls me to it, and I do it for their sake, not just for my own. Work becomes a calling when we understand it as God's assignment to love and serve Him and others. Moms that stay at home, that work countless hours to take care of your children, that is an assignment of God to love and serve Him and others. Teachers, garbage collectors, Doctors, lawyers, accountants, it is God's assignment to love and serve Him and others. And, and maybe, especially if you're still in school and you're trying to figure out what's next for you, what job you're one day going to do, maybe 
Instead of asking, what job can you do one day that will earn you the most money or that will give you the best status? Maybe rather than asking that, you should ask, with the abilities that God has given me, with the opportunities that He's provided me, what job can I do that would be of the greatest service to God and to my neighbor? And when we start thinking about work that way, here's the beauty. As Christians, we don't have to work for the church full time. We don't have to work for a nonprofit or a charity to be in ministry, to live out a calling. We can do any job and love God and love others through our jobs. Through our work, we can do for one another what God wants to do for us and what God wants to do through us. And that is how a spiritual life starts to connect to our everyday life. That friend of mine said, I don't know how, if I even think about God once during the day at work. Maybe that is the way that you start to make that connection. By saying each and every time I get to do something that affects the life of another person in any way. When I count the notes that they bring to the bank as a teller. When I stamp a document if you work for government. When I fill in a contract, when I sign that contract, whatever your job may be, when I see a patient, when I teach a difficult child, every opportunity is an opportunity to reflect the character of God and to love my neighbor. Let's pray. God, thank you that we are not doomed to a life where a third of our of our daily hours, with the majority of our waking hours, are subjected to some form of slavery, to a job we hate, that we only do to earn money, or that we only do to earn self-actualization through it. Thank you, Jesus, that in you we are set free from those pressures. Because in you we have our identity. In you we have been set free from every bondage and slavery that exists. And in you, we find meaning and purpose that we didn't even know existed before. God, you are a working God. You're a creative God. Your mastery is evident all around us. And the people sitting in this room and the tree growing outside. Even in the yellow jacket that chases us around. Your detail is just so beautiful. And God, I pray that our view of work would change. That we will no longer see work as something that I just have to do as a means to an end. But that I would see my work that I do every day, whether for a student it is studying hard for a mother raising a children for a staff member doing it well whatever it might be I pray that we would see every bit of work we do as a way to reflect your beauty to this world and as a way to love our neighbors we pray it in Jesus name Amen